Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture number four in this modern C++ course. Today we're going to cover the STL library, the standard template library, and we're going to start with STL containers. So containers are object holders for collections of other objects. And we'll start by motivating why should we use these C++ containers? Because some C programmers may say, yeah, I can solve everything with arrays, with plain arrays, but we'll see some drawbacks of that. For example, if we want to check the size of an array, we have to perform this non very clear operation that we can see here. So we have to get the size of the array and then divide by the size of the first element, which if you have been programming with C, maybe you already know what this means, but is the intent of the program is not clear. The op if instead we want to use the standard arrays, the STL containers, then what we will have to use is the function size, which is pretty clear and pretty straightforward. The same happens if we want to check for an empty, contain an empty container. There is no standard way of doing this using arrays, but if instead we use the again uh, a standard container, a container from the STL library like vector, we just have to call the function empty, which will return a, a boolean if the uh, saying true if the vector is empty or false if the vector is not. So again, the intent of the program is clear in in the code itself. It's, there is no necessity of creating, uh, of adding any other comment. Also, let's say that we want to access the last element of, of an array or of a container. In this case, if we use arrays, we will have to somehow remember the, the length of the array. Because, for example, here we have only two elements and we can always access this, the element in the position three but in this case, it's not clear well, what will be the result of this operation because our container only has the positions occupy the positions zero and one. So if we want to access to position number three, we will. I mean, this program will still compile, will still uh, run, but we will have a bug because what we are accessing in the position number three is not exactly what we want. If instead, again, we use, for example, arrays when we uh, want to access the last element, we just call the function back. And this will give us the last element of this array. Again, if we want to, for ex another example, is if you want to clear uh, the element, so clear all the elements of the, of the container, we have to use this external function to set to zero all, all the uh, all the elements of this of this array and we have to pass the size here too so again if you have been programming maybe you know what the what this program is doing but otherwise it's not very straightforward if instead we use a vector for example we just can call the function clear and when doing that we just know that the the vector will be so we'll remove all the elements from the vector and we already know what's happening because the function is clear enough. Yeah. So remember that we shouldn't use or you shouldn't use a vectors of characters. We have the, already the uh, string, which is, a, which is a container. So use string instead of, of array of characters. This is just an example. So then to wrap up, why should we use container? I mean, the first question is why not? We have it there. We have them there. and we can freely use them. The, also, they improve the readability of the code and add some functionalities on top of arrays. Like we described before, size, empty, front, back, swap. I, um, on top of that, we can uh, leverage the STL algorithms. That is something that we'll see at the end of this lecture for free. So in this case, when we use the standard containers, we can use also the STL algorithms that solve problems for us. And we don't have to implement everything from scratch. And much more. So again, as always, in, in each lecture, we try to remind you that in C++, the world is split in two. In the static world, this is everything that happens before your program runs. So at compile time and 
the dynamic world, which is happening at runtime. This means when you are running your program. So with containers, the same happens. We have arrays, which are the standard, the default container, uh, that is the static container, let's say, because you have to specify when you declare it, not only the type, but also the size. So the size of this array means how many elements we will use in this array, and this, is, this memory is, is reserved, and we cannot change its size. This means that throughout the whole program, so we will have an array with the same size. We cannot change it. So at compile time, we reserve, for example, in this case, three, um, an array will, will have three elements, and then we cannot change its size. So it's solved at compile time. In this example, we can just we can see how we initialize uh, the array and how to, for example, iterate over it and check if it's empty and check its size. Again, all these these examples that we give, the idea is that you could copy and paste them in your local computer and test them. So to use arrays, we have to uh, include the arrays. Um, uh, so you have we have to add this statement at the beginning. And these are uh, arrays are collections of items of the same type. We cannot, uh, for example, create an array that will store strings and integers. We can just store one type uh, of data. This is a way of creating the array, so which is declaring the array, specifying the type and the number of elements. This is will be the number, the name of the variable, and in this case, we are initializing with these three values. And to access the array, we have to use the square brackets and put the index. And remember that in C++, the indices start at zero. To get the number of elements, we use size. And there are some aliases to access to the first and the last element, which is front and back. When we know in advance at compile time the number of elements that we need, for example, if we are expecting an RGB value for a color, we can create a static container, an array, because we already know, again, how many elements we want. In this case, three. But whenever we're working, for example, with sensors and we don't know how many data points we'll get, or we just don't know how, at compile time the number of elements that we will store, then we can use a dynamic container, which is the default dynamic container is the vector. And then, in this case, we don't need to specify at compile time the number of elements, but only the type, for example, integers or string. And at runtime, then we can add elements. Like, for example, here to this list of names, we can add this other name, and the size of the vector will be increased. So to use vectors, we just need to add this header and is implemented as a dynamic table. It's the same as array, but again, in this case, the size can change at runtime. Again, we can use clear, size, the same functions. And to add new values, we can emplace back, which is the preferred way of doing it, and we can also use the pushback because it's a function that was used before. So the takeaway for vectors is to use them because they are flexible and they are fast. But in the same way as arrays, we can only store elements of the same type. For arrays, at compile time we already know how much memory this variable will need or this container will need. So we can allocate in advance the amount of memory that we will use. But in the case of vectors, we don't know in advance, because that's the whole point of vectors. So there's this concept of capacity, which is not the same as size, but rather is the amount of memory reserved in advance for the vectors. And whenever we use a lot of push or in placeback operations, and we, and we increase several times the size of the vector, we'll have to also increase the capacity of the vector. And this is a time-consuming operation, because we have to allocate memory uh, in our system to store this new vector. So we want to avoid this operation. And then we can optimize our code if we include this reserve function, which will in advance say, uh, tell to the compiler that we want roughly, so n is an approximate number, we will tell in advance to the compiler how many elements we are expecting, and then in, in this way we can optimize our code because in a 
even if we don't know the exact number of elements that we have, we can avoid these many uh, uh, operations to increase the capacity and we can avoid all reallocating memory uh, with different calls. So this is an example of how it works. At the beginning, we have size zero and capacity zero. When we reserve, in this case, 100 elements, the capacity is 100, but the size is still zero. Then we run a hundred times this and place back. And then at the end, the size and the capacity are both 100. This means that if we want to emplace back once more, we will have to again increase the capacity. And this will be the operation that is costly. But whenever we don't use this reserve function, again at the beginning we have size and capacity zero. And after running 100 times this emplace back, we'll have size 100 and capacity 128. And this is because when we um, do emplace back several times, the, uh, the program has itself to find a way of increasing the, the memory that the vector needs. So as a takeaway, we should use this reserve function to tell in advance the, to the compiler, okay, store n, uh, store allocate memory for n elements, and then you will use the amount that you need and you can still increase the size of the vector, but you will not lose that many time when calling um, when reallocating memory during your program. This is an, an example of the a real world example on how to use vectors, though this is just to show you that we are, what we are showing you in this case uh, vectors are broadly used. In this case is a vector of, of eigenvector 3D which are three values, so points, normals and colors. So in this case you can see that we are creating vectors of vectors or something similar to that. Uh, so in this case, this is the implementation of one cloud and they are storing points, colors and normals in vectors. So again, this is just to show you that uh, in C++ the vectors are very powerful and are broadly used, utilized. Let's move now into associative containers, which is the way that we have to associate data within the containers. We will start with maps, which is a sorted associative container. So consists of consisting of key and value pairs in which the keys should be unique and they should be comparable. This means that we should be able to say which one is larger than the other. All the built-in types are already comparable and we will teach you in the following lectures how to make your own type comparable so you can use them in maps. Values can, can take any type and this is what we call dictionaries in Python. So how to create a map, we have to use these angular brackets and specify the type of the key and the type of the value. And then this is the way of initializing. So this will be a, pa a key value pair and this we here we can specify others. And we can, we can check its size, add new values using the emplace function, modify or add items accessing it by the key and then we change the value. Uh, get code references this way and we, ch we can check if there is a, an element present in that map using this count. I mean the keys are unique so there should be only one element there. there. Uh, and that's why, so this is not super clear and that's why in C++20 this function was added, returns return a, bool, a, bool, a boolean variable that says if the key is present or not. So here is an example, we will try to run it online so you see that it's actually not that difficult to use. So let's move into VS Code and let's hope that this works quite fast. So we will first just create this map.cpp file, we open it, we will start including iostream to plot some stuff, we'll include a map and we will include also string. So let's start with the, for the beginning. We want to create a map, so a CD map. We specify the type of the keys. In this case, we will choose integers and the values will be strings. And we'll call these uh, students. So this will be the list of students. Then we can already initialize it. For example, specifying the first key and value pair we will 
use this example and then we can always so this is a dynamic um, container because we can add elements at runtime so what we will do is we will just use the emplace function to add a key value pair in this case i will add my name here and then yeah let's do it again Uh, so you can see that this is sorted. Let's now uh, we we'll change the value here. Okay, then we will create this for, for loop. This is a way of iterating over the over the map which is quite new and useful mm, name so you can see nothing really weird i'm just coding everything now let's also check the size of the array of the map so let's now now compile it so cpp c++ map.cpp so you can see that this way of Iterating over the map is quite new, it's since C17. So if we specify the standard, it will not complain. And then we can route, run the, the binary that we have created, and this should print all the names in order. In this case, we can see that we have created, we have added first this value, uh, 1500. 1, 109 and then different values in different orders but in the end they should be all uh, sorted so when we create it you can see that the these uh, key value pairs are organized and are sorted with the key uh, in a ascending order using the keys so let's go back to the slides again you can try this example uh, in locally in your computers but it's just as simple as I have showed you. We move now into another maps, which are basically as the name depicts, is a map in which the elements are not ordered. This is implemented as a hash table. This means that the keys should be hashable, and this means that we the hash function will map an arbitrary length uh, value or key in this case, for example, this string that can be the different sizes into a fixed size um, value in this case for example an integer so this uh, will allow you will allow us to implement this as a hash table so this hash will be the way that we have to index uh, to to index the, this hash table so this is faster because this does not require any sorting so again same as map as a hash table, this is important, and the key type should be hashable. Usually, the, the typically used uh, types are already hashable, so we don't have to implement anything. And again, same as map, and is faster, because we don't have to sort anything. So if we move to our previous example, we can just change map for an order map. Order map, same here. And then we just compile the program with standard C17. And we run the program, and we can you can see that we are using basically the same syntax. The program is basically the same, but in this case, you can check in the results that uh, in this case the elements are not sorted uh, using the keys.
So again, you can check this program at your uh, locally in your computers, but you will realize that it's the same as the previous one. Regarding the hash function, all the built-in types already have a hash function implemented, so you don't have to worry about that. How to iterate over maps is as so previously, the idea was to have a key value pair in which you will access uh, the, this first element. This means the key using dot first and using dot second to access the value. But since C17, and this is why uh, we had to add that standard when compiling it, we can iterate over them by using here, you can check a reference, a constant reference to these keys and values in this map, and then it's just as easy as in Python. So uh, again, every element is a pair and in the map we have the keys are sorted and in the unordered map they are in a random order. This is a, again an example of the, an implementation of Open3D. For those of you who don't know what the block circuit is, uh, imagine that if you discretize a 2D space, you have a grid, for example in an image, you have a 2D grid or occupancy grid, and here what we have is a bulk cell grid, is the same as that but in 3D. So you can see that here they are using an, an order map, so again it's just to show you that this is used in real life. This will be the type of the keys and this will be the values, the type of the values. And since, uh, they since this type of the keys, I get a colon colon vector 3i, is not a built-in type, they have to also provide, provide the hash function. So you can check more about these containers and how to use them, the different functionalities in the CPP reference uh, website. You can see that there are also sets, multi-sets, multi-maps, forward list, and continuing you also have stack, queue, priority queue. So whenever you have to work with some some of these type of data just don't create your own type and use the ones that come in the the containers that come in the standard template library we'll now move into iterators which are the way that we have to use algorithms in a generic way so let's say that for example we want to create the print function to print the uh, the content of different types of data in this case vectors and arrays so let's do it together Let's first create a new file here and open it. So we'll start again including IO stream since we want to print stuff. We want also vector and array. So Let's create our main function in which we will create an array of 10 integers called R and we will initialize it with these values. We will also create the vector the same way Remember, you don't have to specify the number. And now what we, what we would want is to... So let's say that I want to print the content of the array. So this print function should take the array and print it. And we want to create also... We want to use the same print function to print the content of our vector. So what we will typically do is we will create uh, a print function that in this case uh, will take so in this case for example for arrays we'll take an array of 10 integers we have to specify again here the dimension as uh, and the type so this will take the array and we'll basically iterate over all the elements. Hmm, value. And we'll just print 
this value and add just a space. And after the for loop, let's print a new line. So this is again the print function that we will create. Sorry, this is CD that we create for array, but we also want one for vectors. So we have to overload this function that we've seen this before. So it's for a vector of integers. We just check here, and then we have we can compile our program, print on CPP. And we are printing uh, both, so both um, containers, both variables that we have created, the vector and the array. But let's say that now we want to also uh, print the content of a list. So we have to again create a new function. So basically overlap that function to work with lists. So let's include your list and, sorry, and create a list here. So uh, we want to avoid this. So what we can do instead, let's create another function which will be... So this is basically what we want to use the same function to print the three different objects. So what we can do is we can use iterators. So don't pay attention to this. This is just something we have to do to make it work. But the idea is to show you something else. Now, this is something that we will see in the future. So we create a print function that will take uh, as arguments iterators, begin and end. And so in a generic way, we will just get these iterators, which is where is the beginning of the container at the end of the container. We just iterate over all, over all the elements. So iterate, iterate an iterator IT and initialize it with begin. We will want this for loop to go until IT um, while IT is not equal as end. And we want to, so here is it. So what we want to do is again, just print the content. And in this case, to access the content, we have to use the star operator. Again, and space, and at the end, Okay, so in this case now we have created a function which is called print it. Sorry, that we want to use with a generic with iterators to uh, go over the data in a generic way. To do that, we have to use the iterators. So this will, this is a way of saying, okay, just iterate over this array from the begin to the end. And yeah, the same for the vector and the same for the list. So here, instead of array, let's try vector. And here, let's try our list L. So in this case, what we want again is the same function print IT to work with different uh, containers. So if we now compile this, you can see that we can also run and this is working with lists. So instead of creating three different functions, we just create the same and this works with iterators. So these are the examples that I've written in the naive way will be to uh, write the print implementation for it type and overload it. But we would like to use one single function to uh, use different to print the content of different containers. And we can use iterators as an interface between the containers itself and the print function. So we are creating a print function that is generic to different uh, types. And then using the iterators, we, this allows us to access to all the elements of this container. So this is the example. And now, what are iterators then? They are the, glues, the, the glue that ties the standard library algorithms that we will see now we'll see uh, next with 
the different kind of data. So the idea is that we write algorithms in a generic way that works with different uh, structures, different data structures, different objects. So again, as I mentioned before, if we want to if we want to write the sort function and use it with vectors, maps, or lists, we have to write three implementations and overload this sort function. But if instead we write the single sort function that works with iterators, what we will do is use the same function but that will work with vector, map, and lists. So instead of this function expect like a vector or expect a map or references to these data types, we will expect iterators and then we will say, okay, this is the beginning of the container, this is the end, just sort it. So again, as I mentioned before, the SQL containers are well are similar to pointers in the sense that you have to specify, for example, where it starts and it, it ends, uh, allow quick navigation through the containers, the algorithms on the uh, standard template library use iterators, and are defined for all the STL containers. So as you've seen in the example, the star operator is used to access the elements. Uh, this is similar to the pointer syntax. We can also um, move to the next element by using this plus plus notation. Our yeah, prefer to use this range for loops and we can compare iterators. So whenever we want to use these iterators, we have so we have this uh, different type of them. So we have the begin iterator, which will basically return so begin function will return an iterator of to the beginning of the container, and C begin is just because it's a constant uh, iterator. The same happens with n. When we call this function, it will return an iterator to the end of the container, and if we use C end, we'll return a constant iterator. So same happens with reverse begin and reverse end. But what are the STL algorithms? So this is already implemented algorithms, more than 80, that uh, are in the standard template library that we include just by using include algorithm and they operate on sequences defined, defined by pairs of iterators, for example, begin and end or a single iterator, for example, begin. And the idea of these algorithms is that you should, then, you should avoid reinventing the wheel. This means if you want to sort some kind of data, you don't have to create your own sort function, but rather use the one that is in this, in this STL library. For example, yeah, in this case, you have to avoid writing these algorithms on your own because they are already implemented and they will be as fast, at least as fast, if not faster, than whatever code that you can write, most probably, because these are algorithms that are already optimized. So again, just as the title says, make it bigger, don't reinvent the wheel. If you want to use a sort function, go and check in the algorithms in the, if the function is already there. And as I mentioned before, when, when you are creating your own data type, if you create implementations for the standard iterators, then you will, uh, you will get access to all the algorithms in this standard library. So if you are thinking, okay, I'm, I'm creating my new data type and I want to create a sort function, I want to create a find function, and all these things that you may do on your own, they are already implemented. So it's better for you to implement the iterators for this data type and then uh, work with the standard algorithms. So yeah, as I mentioned before, <laughs> most probably the the functions or the algorithms implemented there will be at least as fast and the one you can read. So here we selected a few algorithms just to skim over them because there are a lot, but it's to motivate you on why you should use iterators and why you should use the, algor the algorithms in the standard library instead of creating your own ones. For example, the sort algorithm, you will provide the begin and the end of, so the, the iterators of the begin and the end of the container, and then it will just sort it. So as you can see, the input is not sorted, the output it is. Here you can, for example, instead uh, pass the reverse begin and reverse end iterators, and then you will sort it the other way around, 
or you can just say okay instead of starting from the beginning you can say for example begin plus two and then you will not sort the whole array but rather this portion so another algorithm fine very straightforward you say the begin and the end you have to specify the begin and the end of the container and the value you want to find and so this will return another operator another iterator and if the iterator is the same as the end then the so it means that this algorithm basically have gone over all the values and have not found it fill algorithm pretty straightforward again you say you specify the begin and the end and the value you want to fill with and yeah for example this is the output again just these are very easy exercises just to motivate you very easy examples just to motivate you to use these algorithms instead of writing your own one okay count so in this case we have this vector and we want to count how many threes or many fives are in there so we just specify so we, we use the algorithm count we specify the begin and the end of the iterator and the number that we want to count in this case n1 so this function will return the number of times that this element appears there so how will you implement this is probably with some for loops comparing every value and then incrementing a counter instead of doing that you can just uh, pass the iterators to this algorithm and then you get free access to this algorithm you don't have to write it on your own and you avoid creating for loops you, in one line of code you are doing everything count if so here we start to see that there are also some more interesting algorithms for example here we want to count how many numbers are divisible by three so we create this function again this function can be anything that you want to check and in this function what we are interested in is in seeing if the number is divis divisible by three so whenever this number is divisible by three we are returning true so basically this function is counting how many times in this container we space in which for which we specify the beginning and the end how many times this function returns true so in this case since the the answer is four but remember you can change this function so this can for example count how many times you get the three there i mean you can do it with the other function too but then you say okay how many times this i is equal to three and then it will return true and then you will count the number of threes that are in that container so again this is in this case we are showing everything all the examples with vectors but we can use another uh, kind of data structure since as you can see in all the examples we are not passing vectors in this case but rather the iterator for the beginning and the iterator from the end for each so this also is something that is an algorithm that will avoid you to write for loops and in this case we want to check uh, we want to print all the elements of a value so we can just use this for each algorithm in which we specify the beginning the end and we want this function to be applied so this is a lambda function and in this case we are just up applying this operation to all the elements of the of the uh, vector in this case but to the container we are specifying the beginning and the end so this print function could be whatever you operation you want to apply to all of them and in this case instead of just running a for loop and accessing each key and value or each value in this case of the vector and doing some operation you can just write it everything more compact in one single line all of and again another example here we want to uh, we want to check uh, how many if all of the elements satisfy some condition so we have this even function which will return true if the element is divisible by two or if it's an even number and then we just say okay then uh, tell me if all the elements are even oh, this means tell me if all the elements in this container between the, the iterator begin and iterator end satisfy uh, when you apply this function return true so this is again another example of an algorithm in the standard library that will uh, avoid so you can use to avoid creating a lot of for loops rotate in this case we, you have to specify the beginning the end and the point in which you, you want to rotate in this case is plus uh, is the begin plus two so this means that uh, as you can see here in the result this is the 
original the original vector and what we want when we what we say is that we want to rotate in this point so this is begin plus two so what will happen is basically this latest part so the, the first part will be pasted at the end as you can see here so as you can see also the notation that we can access uh, so we can pass the begin plus two instead of just passing the value for example so in this case we are using again upper uh, iterators to specify the begin the end and the position in which we want to rotate this uh, vector in this case transform okay in this case we also want to apply this function uppercase we specify the source which is the the begin and end of this source string and then we specify where do we want to put the result in this case with the begin operator only and then we will apply this function so this function again we specify only so it's not something that we do in situ as we did in, in other functions but this is transforming so it could be possible that the result is not the same size as the input and that's why we have to specify the beginning of this new container and you can see here that the input is lowercase hello and the output is uppercase hello. Another example of an algorithm that you can uh, find in the standard library is accumulate. In this case, we specify the beginning, the end, and here we just want to get the sum. And we can also specify, for example, in this case, this function, and we will accumulate the product instead of accumulating just the numbers. Another pretty straightforward example is the max function, will, which will return the maximum value between two in this case, the mean element which will, as you can see here it will say okay mean element will return an iterator um, and then we to show where's the location we will have we will compute the distance between the beginning and the result and then we will find what's the position of this minimum value we have the min max element which is again another combination of this and you can see that it will return two iterators and here with a star operator we access uh, through the value the mean and max value the clamp function which is a function that if you uh, have worked in robotics some sometimes you have to implement yourself so you we specify a, a minimum and a maximum value and then this will say okay if the value is greater than the maximum value for example this 1.1 we will just Cut, cut it and say okay the the output will be the maximum value and the same happens with the minimum value so if we have a number which is smaller than the minimum value then we will stick to the minimum value sample this is um, a function that you had to use in the homework assignments and allows you to so first you have to specify a random device and then you can have as many samples as you want from in this case this string so we have this c++ school string and this out string which so far is empty we say okay we want five letters and then what we want is we will specify the begin and the end uh, iterator for this in string which is c++ school then we have to the, don't worry about this this is the notation how you have to use this function then the amount of of samples that you want and then the random device and so this example it will be different for each computation because this should be random so in this case uh, what we sample from this uh, from this c++ school is c++ cl these are the the five characters that we want at the end i hope you are now excited about the capability of c++ the standard algorithms that you can use if you provide the implementation of iterators or if you are using the standard containers so again, it's a way of not reinventing the wheel and using uh, already out of the box uh, algorithms that you don't have to write on your own. So this is the suggested video of this week. Uh, if you want to get in touch with all the algorithms of the standard library, you can check this video out. The references as always are the C++ book and the cppreference.com website. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'm looking forward to see you in the following ones and thank you for your attention.